ذكر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا أن لهم أجرا كبيرا وأن الذين لا يؤمنون بالآخرة أعتدنا لهم عذابا أليما ويدعو الإنسان بالشور دعاءه بالخير وكان الإنسان عجولا وجعلنا الليل والنهار آيتين فمحونا آية الليل وجعلنا آية النهار مبصرة مبصرة لتبتغوا فضلا من ربكم ولتعلموا عدد السنين والحساب وكل شيء فصلناه تفصيلا وكل إنسان ألزمناه طائره في عنقه ونخرج له يوم القيامة كتابا يلقاه منصورا اقرأ كتابك كفى بنفسك اليوم عليك حسيبا صدق الله العلي العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين وتقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم الحمد لله والشكر لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم أيها الحبة في الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته السلام The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminds us وَخَيْوُ الْحَدِيثِ كِتَابُ اللَّهِ The best speech is the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala It's nothing, no matter how good our lectures are and how good our speeches are but nothing can compare or equate to the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala There's always barakah, there's sakina that descends, there's rahmah that descends The malaika descend and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remembers us in a gathering even better than this gathering. So alhamdulillah we are very comfortable and safe in the atmospheres of Al-Quran al-Kareem. Alhamdulillah today we are departing now from Damascus, uh, from Jordan then to Syria and uh, from Damascus inshallah we are now on the bus through to Lebanon and then to Egypt and uh, Alhamdulillah that's why we will ask Fadila to Sheikh Fakhuddin maybe to just explain to us a little bit about the general conditions in Lebanon because it's very much a Christian and a Muslim country and uh, there are some dynamics it's a beautiful touristic destination so we'll be having some good uh, family holidays as well Alhamdulillah and then from there we will be proceeding towards Sayyidina al Hussein in Egypt. And Jamiatul Azhar. There's something about Jamiatul Azhar and the resting place of Imam al Hussein, at least his honorable head. Although we as um, people of uh, Ihsan believe that the head and the body are never separated. Uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirms that those who pass away and die in his path, they are indeed alive. So, wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa Come through, your sister Fatima. Please, bismillah. So the one who is alive, definitely cannot be alive with the separation of the head and the body. So when we go to Karbala, we indeed make salam and salutations to the whole of Sayyidina al Hussein. And we do the same in Egypt, alhamdulillah. And there is some barakah and some khair about Jamiatul Azhar being right in front of Sayyidina Hussein, that it has survived almost a thousand years. So inshallah, maybe Sheikh Fakhuddin can explain to us a bit about Jamiatul Azhar al-Sharif. Then amongst the great maqams in Egypt is the maqam Sayyidina Zainab, Sayyidina Nafisa, Imam al-Shafi'i. And maybe we'll ask the Sheikh to speak a bit about the Ahram, the pyramids. Sure. You know, so it's important for us to know some of these historical sites and amazing feats, but also lessons to be learned 
from the people of the Pharaonic period. So inshallah, without further ado, we'd like to ask Sheikh Fakhuddin Uwaisi to take us on this beautiful journey. So just to recap, you we land in Masjid Al-Aqsa, and from Al-Aqsa, inshallah, we'll be moving towards Jordan, uh, maybe they are on New Year's Eve, and then from there we will move towards uh, Damascus, Syria, and Homs, where Sayyidina Khalid ibn Walid is as well, and Hama. And then from there we will be moving towards Lebanon, and from Lebanon, inshallah, our final destination mm. will be in Egypt. So really a must. Masr, yeah. So really a beautiful, the land of Yusuf alayhi salam. Mm. So maybe the Sheikh can take us from Yusuf alayhi salam down. And then inshallah we can uh, discuss some of these great ziyarats in Egypt, inshallah. Land of Quran. They say in many instances, Nuzil al Quran fil Hijaz. The Quran was revealed in Mecca and Medina, Hijaz. Wa quri al Quran fi Misr. And the Quran is recited in Egypt. So, alhamdulillah. So, without further ado, we say, Faliyat al Mashkura to Faliyat al Shaykh Fakhuddin Uwaisi al Madani to speak to us a little bit about Lebanon and then to move over to the land of Yusuf alayhi salam. So inshallah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Mawlana Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahabihi wa manwala. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatiha lima awlaq wa al-Khatim wa lima sabaq nasir al-Haqqi bil-Haqq wa al-Hadi ila suratika al-Mustaqim wa ala alihi haqqa qadrihi wa miqdarihi al-Azim. Amma ba'd, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. So we continue today with our journey in the holy land of Bilad al-Sham. And I mentioned previously that uh, the holy land that is praised in the Quran, which is Bilad al-Sham, uh, includes the whole of Palestine, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. So all of that is part of the holy land, al-Sham. So therefore, from Syria, you will move into Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon is a country of a uh, mixed, uh, mixed population. Uh, at least 50% of the population is Christian, uh, Christian Arabs, by the way. And uh, so they speak Arabic, the language is Arabic. They identify as Arab, but they are Christians. Uh, they belong usually to the Maronite church. And uh, interestingly, uh, they, the, the name they use for God is Allah. Yeah, so don't be surprised if, if you if a Christian Arab says, if you ask him, how are you doing? He says, Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah, and Allah khaliq, and uh, you know, Allah is commonly used. So uh, people think that's Arabic, but that's, and uh, even the Bible, the Arabic Bible, uh, throughout the Bible, the name Allah is used. You know, they even start the Bible with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which they plagiarize from the Quran. So, there was, I mean, once upon a time in the USA, where some of the very uh, Islamophobic Christians were very upset at the statement. Somebody made a statement, one of the scholars in one of the interfaith meetings with people of different religions were there and they said, you know, end of the day, whether it's Allah or God, you know, it's, it's one God we all worship. Whether you're Jewish or Christian, the Creator. So one of the Islamophobic Christians got very angry. He said, Allah is not God. And I don't worship Allah. Allah is not God. Uh, that's not our God. That is the Muslim God. Allah is the Muslim God. You know, we worship. You know, we are Christians. So somebody told them, if you just go open the Christian Bible, throughout the whole Bible, God is referred to as Allah. You know, so Allah, you know, is all what all the Christians of the East refer to God as Allah. You know. So you don't have to become so fanatical about it and say that's the Muslim God and our one is God. And for all means and purposes, Jesus didn't speak English. So Jesus was a Palestinian Jew and he never ever used the word God once in his life. Because uh, English did not even exist in the time of Jesus. Right? English is not 2000 years old, it's about 800 years old. So he never used the word God. The word Jesus was using for what you call God was Allah, <laughs> you know, and that's in the Bible. So uh, the Arab Christians are interesting uh, feature and, uh, and their presence in large numbers is a proof of the tolerance of the Muslim 
rule. That even though Muslims ruled there for 1400 years, they've been ruling in Lebanon and Egypt and these places and Syria, there are still millions of Christians there. There was no inquisition, there was no genocide, you know, holocaust, you know, wiping out an entire race of people, entire religion. Nothing like that happened. If it did, then how come there's still millions of Christians still living there? And they have churches that are dating, that are dated a thousand years old, two thousand, five, you know, uh, one thousand five hundred years old. They have churches that are even dating, they were dated to pre-Islamic times, before the Muslims conquered those lands. Those churches are still standing. So the, again, a contradiction like that happened where one of the Christian guys was standing there and saying, these are the lands and we are here in this church of uh, Lebanon, this great church, ancient church and, you know, the Muslims took over these lands. And again, it was some American Islamophobic guy, you know, an evangelical and said the Muslims took over these lands and, you know, they genocided the Christians and, you know, and whatever and blah, blah, blah. And, and that's why so somebody said, uh, you just said you're standing by this ancient church. Check the date on that church, you know. You yourself said that is 1,400 something. So that church is before the Muslims conquered uh, Lebanon. It's still standing there and there's prayer still going on there. So when you say Muslims wiped out Christianity, then how come this church is still standing there and people are still praying there? So um, this is because the Prophet ﷺ had told the Muslims that Ahlul Kitab uh, are to be respected and uh, they must be granted all freedom of worship. Their churches must not be destroyed in any battle and their priests must not be harmed. And they should be granted full rights to practice their religion as they see fit. Even if we disagree with the religion, we uh, don't agree with their beliefs, but they have a right to follow what they are following. So, uh, and they were, the title used in Islam for such people was Ahlul Zimma. Ahlul Zimma which means the people of the covenant or the agreement or people under our protection people under our protection so the Prophet ﷺ stated that whoever harms anyone from the Ahlul Zimma any Muslim that harms a man from the Ahlul Zimma shall not smell the fragrance of Jannah and indeed its fragrance can be smelled at a distance of 500 years so uh, Muslims are very careful of not to hurt and abuse the Ahlul Zimma. So therefore even in Egypt you have about 10 to 15 million Christians. And you might be surprised when you drive through Cairo the amount of churches you see. And they've got large, large crosses. You know, you see a minaret here, then you see a cross there, then a minaret, then a cross, then, you know, it's all over the show. Uh, so that is a testimony to the Muslim treatment of the non-Muslim minorities in their lands. Go to Spain and see how many masjids are left. I'm not talking about the masjid the Pakistanis built 10 years ago, or the Saudis built 15 years ago. The, the masjids from when the Muslims were living in Spain and ruling Spain. Nothing, not one was spared. Every one of them was either demolished or converted to a church. And every single Muslim was expelled. Uh, when the Christians took over Spain, uh, there were 3 million Muslims living in Spain. 3 million Muslims. That's in 1492 when the reconquest, as they call it, the, the Spaniards took over Spain again from the Muslims, the Arabs. From the 3 million, 1 million uh, had to leave. They left uh, because they made the, the, the Christians, the Catholics at the time, uh, told the Muslims that if you want to stay in Spain, you have to convert to Christianity. So either you leave or either you convert. So a million Muslims left Spain and they've been living there for centuries. They left and they went to Morocco. That's why in Morocco there's still so many families who are of Andalusian origin. Uh, some of them even have keys of their homes in Spain. Some families still have this. This is our home in 700 years ago, 800 years ago. We were expelled. The one million left and another million decided to convert to Christianity to save their lives. Uh, but continued to practice Islam secretly. It was not a real conversion, but they did it for the sake of, you know, we got no other choice. Uh, and another million refused to leave or convert, and those were killed. They would be killed. They would be brought forward and executed in, in large numbers on a daily basis. Uh, to the point that the Christian historians wrote that uh, these executions would be public, and they felt that it should be stopped and done privately. 
He said, why? Because the spirit of the Muslim is starting to impress the Christians. Because he said, the man would come, he said, do you have anything to say? The priest will stand there with the cross. He said, I can still baptize you and save your soul from the devil, you know, and from hellfire before we throw you into the fire, because it will be thrown in the fire. So the Muslim would look at him and say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna wahdahu la sharika lahu, wahidun ahadun lam yalid wa lam yulad. He has no father and he has no son. They push him in the fire. You know, so they said the Christians would get impressed that these people don't get scared. You know, they just go there and they just. So at one stage the priest said, rather do this privately because this is having opposite effect. So this is how they treated the Muslims. But. You go to the, today the Muslim lands, you find lots of non-Muslim minorities. India was ruled by Muslims for a thousand years. Yet today it's still a majority Hindu country. So anyways, uh, you find that in uh, Lebanon, so Lebanon is about 50% Christian and then 50% Muslim. Now the 50% Muslim also is divided into, equally divided into Sunni and Shia. So 50% of the Muslims in Lebanon as well, are, half of them are Sunni and half of them are Shia. And the Shia kind of have more power and sway there. And particularly, you know, the Hezbollah movement uh, that's based in Lebanon, you know, led by Hassan Nasrallah, is extremely strong. So they also have a lot of political clouds. Southern Lebanon is basically all Shia, you know. So um, the sectarian, you know, problems have always been around there. You know, they come up and they go away and so on. But generally, they try to keep the peace. The, the rule in Lebanon is, that the president must be a Maronite Christian, the prime minister must be a Shia Muslim, and the speaker of the parliament must be a Sunni Muslim. That is written in their constitution. Yeah, that's how serious the religion, sec the religious sectarian sens sensitivity is. It's the Trinity. Hmm? It's like a Trinity. The Trinity, yeah. <laughs> that is in their law. Just like in Iraq, they have the same thing. The Prime Minister, President, so one must be a Shia Muslim, usually the most powerful position is for the Shia Muslim because they are the majority group. Then the other position is for the Kurdish guy and then the third one for the, the Sunni Muslim Arab to please all the factions in the country. So they don't pretend like our country that everybody loves each other. They tell you Israel, we hate each other. So let's have this agreement, you here, you here, you here. <laughs> They've tried pretending to love each other, they realize it doesn't work. So rather let's say, okay, there's three positions here, you take one, my group takes one, you can and we'll make it work. Because uh, you're going to get democracy, it's only going to be one group in power and everybody else will be left out and there's a civil war. And you know that Lebanon had a civil war for 30 years in which hundreds of thousands of people have been killed. Currently it's in peace, uh, but anyways, uh, it's also a very beautiful country. There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, natural beauty there. As far as uh, Islamic uh, places are concerned, uh, uh, in, in, not many really, you know, maqams of Sahaba and, and so on in, in Lebanon. That, but there is one maqam that if you get a chance that you should go visit. And that is the maqam of Al-Imam Al-Awza'i. Mm. Al-Imam Al-Awza'i. Now who was Imam Al-Awza'i? To understand the status of Imam Al-Awza'i, you need to understand that we have the four Imams of Fiqh in Ahlul Sunnah Al-Jama'ah, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Malik, Imam Muhammad bin Hanbal. Now Imam Al-Awza'i was considered the fifth. Yes, and he had his own mazhab. And many of the great scholars and Sufis in the early days used to be actually on his mazhab. Mm -hmm. You know, so originally there were eight mazhabs. Yes. The mazhab of Imam Al-Awza'i, the mazhab of Imam Abu Lais, uh, he's in yeah. Egypt, the, the, the mazhab of Sufyan al-Sawri, and the mazhab of Ibn Hazm Dawood al-Zahiri. So Imam al-Awza'i was the, the mujtahid imams who had his own mazhab. In fact, in his, in his time they used to say the ulama are only four. The ulama in Islam are only four. Abu Hanifa in Iraq, Malik in Hijaz, Shafi'i in Egypt, and Awza'i in Sham. He was known as Imam al-Sham, the Imam of the entire land of the Sham. So this is the ulama are four. Abu Hanifa in Iraq and Malik in the Hijaz in Medina, Imam Malik and Shafi'i in Egypt and Awza'i in Bilad al-Sham. He was also, by the way, from the Taba'u al-Tabi'een. He was born in the year 88, which is basically 80 years, less than 80 years after Rabbi Sallallahu time. 
So he was from the Taba'ut Tabi'in. The Nabi said, لَن يَدْخُلِ النَّارَ مَنْ رَآنِي أَوْ رَآ مَنْ رَآنِي أَوْ رَآ مَنْ رَآ مَنْ رَآنِي He shall not enter the fire who has seen me or seen the one who has seen me or seen the one who has seen the one who saw me. Of course with conditions of Iman and so on, you know, not a kuffar or a munafiq or a... So uh, the Tabi'in, the Prophet also said the best of generations is my generation, you know, uh, and then Summa Ladina Ilulum, then the generation after them, and then the generation after them, and then you know the Ummah will only just deteriorate to worse and worse and worse. So Imam uh, Al Awza'i, his name is Abdul Rahman Al Awza'i, was from the uh, not from the Sahaba, he didn't meet the Prophet. He wasn't from the Tabi'in as well, from those people who met the Sahaba. He was from Tabi'at Tabi'in, he met the Tabi'in. So he was born in Lebanon, in Baalbek. And he grew up there, but he's, uh, after memorizing the Quran, he traveled throughout the Muslim world to seek knowledge. And amongst his ustads, he spent a lot of time in Makkah and Medina. Amongst his ustads were Imam Malik and an Imam Muhammad al Baqir. So in Medina, he also studied under the great Imam of the Ahl al Bayt, Imam Muhammad al Baqir. And if you don't know who Imam Muhammad al Baqir is, he is the son of Imam Zain al Abidin. The son of Imam Zain al Abidin. Imam Zain al Abidin is the son of Imam al Hussein, the martyr of Karbala. And Imam Zain al Abidin was with his father in Karbala. He miraculously survived Karbala. Now, his son is Imam Muhammad al Baqir. And Muhammad al Baqir is a pure Hashemite. Because Imam Zain al Abidin is the son of who? Hussein. Imam Hussein. Now, he was married to the daughter of Imam Hassan. His uncle's daughter, cousin. It was common for the Arabs to marry among cousins and so on. So he was Imam Zain al Abidin, the son of Imam Hussein. He was married to his, his name is Ali by the way. Imam Zain al Abidin's real name is Ali. His title is Zain al Abidin, the most beautiful of the worshippers. Because he used to be a whole night and day in the masjid. So his name is Ali, Ali bin al Hussein, Zain al Abidin. He married Fatima, the daughter of Hassan, his cousin. So it's a marriage of Ali and Fatima, it's interesting, you know, which is the father and mother of Hassan and Hussain. So he married his cousin. So this is the son of Hussain marrying the daughter of Hassan. From that marriage was born Muhammad al-Baqir. Right? So he was a pure Hashemite, Hassani, Husseini, and he was called, his name was Muhammad. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's name. But he was called al-Baqir, which is a short form for Baqir al-Uloom. You know, Baqir al means that who, the one who tears open, you know, the, the, the vessel of knowledge. The Arabic kind of phrase, which means the one who just lets the knowledge flow. You know, if there's knowledge coming out a little bit, little bit he tears it open, he lets the knowledge flow. Baqir al So that's Imam Muhammad al-Baqir. Such a knowledgeable man he was in Medina. And Imam al awzai studied under Imam Muhammad al-Baqir. And he studied under Imam Malik. And he studied under Ibn Shihab al Zuhri. And he studied in Makkah under the Mufti of Makkah, Atab bin Abi Rabah. Atab bin Abi Rabah is from the Tabi'in and the inheritor of the knowledge of Sayyidina Ibn Abbas. <laughs> Nabi Sallallahu said, The Alim of this Ummah is Ibn Abbas, Habrul Ummah. His successor in knowledge, the one who spent 20 years learning from him, was Atab bin Abi Rabah, who was, by the way, a black man, an African originally a slave, freed by Ibn Abbas, trained by Ibn Abbas, became the Sheikh of Makkah and the Mufti of Makkah, that even the Sahabas used to be scared to give a fatwa when Atta is around. Some of the other Sahaba who were not that knowledgeable, not all Sahaba had equal amount of knowledge. So even some of the Sahaba, when the people used to ask them questions, they say, why you ask me when Atta is sitting in the Haram? They say, are you from the Sahaba? He said, the most learned of the Sahaba, you know, was Ibn Abbas, and Atta carries the knowledge of Ibn Abbas. And also know that Ibn Abbas gained all his knowledge from Ali. Because when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi passed away, Ibn Abbas was only 80 years old. And Ibn Abbas used to spend all his time with Sayyidina Ali. And so he had the knowledge of Ali radiallahu anh. So Ata was this man and people used to be surprised. They used to come in the Haram and they see this African man sitting there and everybody is silent in front of him. He is the Shaykh of the Haram. So uh, Ata bin Abi Rabah is a great man from the Tabi'een. Uh, so Imam al awzai studied under him as well. So he studied under a lot of shuyukh and ulama until he became a, a mujtahid imam, a alim in his own right. And he was also a man of great taqwa and ibadah. Those who visited him said, Ma ra'ayna azhada wa a'abada minhu. 
they didn't see a man more away from the dunya and more engrossed in worship like al awzai so he was not just a man of knowledge a man of worship and ibadah uh, he kept his distance from the rulers of the time he got the last period of the umayyad rule and the first period of the abbasid rule both the umayyads and the abbasids tried to appoint him for uh, to be the judge a qadi and he refused he flatly refused to hold any position of qada under both the Umawis and the Abbasis because he knew that they were tyrannical rulers he said no I don't want any position under you guys you know so uh, that was the taqwa and one thing he, one time he did go to the rulers of the time was and that is something that is remembered for him till today is that some of the Christians of Lebanon tried to make a revolt against the Abbasid governor of the time you know there were some Christians and some of them were still like you know we should fight against the Muslims a group of them did that in one of the villages they were crushed by the, the Muslim army of the time the rulers then the Abbasid ruler issued a decree he said I want every Christian kicked out of Lebanon I don't trust these people I want all of them out of Lebanon he issued a decree and that was one village that revolted not all the Christians of Lebanon but the, the, now he wants to take revenge the ruler so when that happened the Christian population of Lebanon went into great you know the turmoil are we all going to be expelled so Imam al awzai went to the Khalifa and said that what you are doing is unjust and unfair he said that you cannot punish the entire population for what some people have done those who rebelled against you, you crushed them, you got them, you killed them, you finished them. But you cannot punish the innocent for what others have done. One group of others for what others have done. So the, the, the Khalifa didn't want to budge. But Imam al awzai continued speaking to him and reminding him of the hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu about the Ahlul Zimma, the Ahlul Kitab, and, and, and the Zulm, and so on. Until the Khalifa, meaning the ruler of the time, changed his mind. He said, fine. It's because of you, he said, Ya Uzai. Wallahi, I was not going to spare them, but because of you. So that is why, till today, even the Christians of Lebanon have great respect for him. Today, when we talk about symbols of tolerance and symbols of these type of things, we don't know our history. So uh, that's why when Imam al-Awzai passed away, they said there were more Jews and Christians in his janazah than Muslims. The Muslims were there, and there were so many Jews, people were surprised, why are they all coming? that they acknowledged his imama, his ibadah, and his sense of justice. So this is one of the great people of, in our history of Islam. You cannot read any book of fiqh except they're going to mention al-Awza'i, a book of hadith. So Imam Malik was asked about Imam al-Awza'i by one of the people who came from Sham. So he said, hold on to him for he's an ocean of knowledge. Imam Malik said about him, he said, hold on to him for he's an imam from the imams of knowledge. So if you are in Beirut, inshallah, inshallah. make ziyara of the maqam of him. It's a beautiful masjid and maqam. And the Lebanese government has also like made it into like a very official, officially recognized place and so on. So you can go to that beautiful masjid al-Imam al awzai and the maqam al-Imam al awzai Then there's the maqam there and everything. So that's somebody you can visit there. So anyways, from there we uh, proceed to, uh, uh, to Egypt. Now interestingly, one of the students of Imam al awzai from the people who was proud to have studied under him as well was none other than Imam Shafi'i. So if you are a Shafi'i, then your Imam was one of the students of Imam al awzai among many other shuyukh, among many other. So Imam al-Shafi'i is buried in Egypt. And Imam al-Shafi'i uh, was not born in Egypt, he was born in Gaza, in Palestine, in what you call Gaza, uh, in Gaza. And uh, Imam Shafi'i was born to a Qurayshi family, a family that descends from Quraysh. His great-great-grandfather uh, was a brother of the great-great-grandfather of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they actually meet up up there and their lineage goes up. And that's why many ulama said that he is the one meant by the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said, Alimu yamla ul arda ilma. The scholar from Quraysh will one day fill the whole world with knowledge. So many of the ulama used to say that's referring to Imam Shafi'i. Because from Quraysh, he was the alim that appeared from Quraysh. So Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anh's grandfather also was from the Sahaba. Great-grandfather Shafi'i was his name. 
Shafi'. That's why it's called a Shafi'i. That Shafi'i was actually from the Sahaba of the Prophet Then Shafi'i's grand, great-grandfather and the Nabi Sassam great-grandfather were brothers. So Imam Shafi'i, uh, at the age of 10, his father passed away, so his mother moved back to Mecca. And he memorized the Quran in Mecca, and from Mecca, he decided to go to move to Medina to learn the deen. And in Medina, he went to study in the halaqa of Imam Malik bin Anas. So when he arrived in Medina, he went to the haram to see who's teaching, and he found Imam Malik teaching there next to the cover of the Nabi Sallallahu So he went to sit in his dars, and he was so poor at that time, his father is not there anymore. He used to write everything he used to hear from Imam Malik on his hand with his finger. So he used to, like that, whatever he hears, he writes on his hand with his finger. So Imam Malik noticed that, so for a few days, so after the end, at the end of the week, he called him, he said, you boy, come here, young boy, 14, 15 years old. So he said, uh, you write everything I say? He said, yes, I do. Like everybody else with paper and pen, said, uh, where do you write it? He said, I write it in my hand. So he thought this guy is joking or what? He said, okay, read for me what you have wrote, uh, written. Okay, you're writing everything, so read for me, read. So they said, Imam al-Shafi'i read all the lessons of hadith from the beginning of the week till the end of the week. All of it, by the Sanad, he read every single hadith, which was probably up to two, three hundred ahadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imam Malik was a muhaddis reading the ahadith. And somebody, nowadays some people doubt these things, but just last week somebody sent me a clip on WhatsApp of this child in Makkah, He's doing exactly the same thing. He was it's like a, in a forum, there was, the child was being questioned, not about Quran, this time about Hadith. He, he memorized all six books of Hadith, this child, and they're asking him, okay, this Hadith, Al Jannatu Tahda Aqdam Al Ummahat, where is it found? Immediately he says, it's found in Sahih Muslim, under this, narrated by Abu Huraira, Hadith number so and so. Okay, what's the Hadith before it? He quotes it. Okay, what's the one after it? He quotes it. Uh, okay, this Hadith, where? Subhanallah. So, yeah. I mean, it's there, on, it's there on YouTube, you can watch it. So, this is in our time, what are you talking about those days? So, when Imam Malik saw that, he was so impressed. So, he held the hand of this boy, he said, My boy, you continue in this path of knowledge, and I see a noor on your face, and wallahi, you will be a great man one day. You will be a great one one day. So, Imam Shafi spent about 10 years in the company of Imam Malik learning from him all his knowledge and he used to say that I spent the first eight years learning knowledge from Imam Malik and then I spent the next two years just learning Adab and Akhlaq hmm. just Adab and Akhlaq okay. so after that he uh, proceeded to learn from uh, other ulama he went to Iraq he, among the ulama he learned from greatly with Imam Abu Hanifa student Imam Muhammad bin Hassan uh, al-Shaybani until Imam al-Shafi'i became a masterly scholar himself and he had hundreds of students he went to Yemen as well in Yemen he was persecuted because he displayed support and love for the Ahl al-Bayt of the Prophet and which at those days was considered a crime and that's where he writes that famous po poetry line where he says if, if loving the they call him Shia you know so he said if loving the family of the Prophet makes me Shia then let the whole world think I'm a Shia you know what wrong have I done? I just love the family of the Prophet So there was this thing on those days. So he was taken to Iraq in chains as a political prisoner. But when the ulama of Iraq saw him and learned from him, they realized that this man is such a knowledgeable scholar that the ulama themselves, the ulama of the court itself, told the Khalifa that please pardon this man. So the Khalifa pardoned him and then Imam Shafi stayed in Iraq and learned uh, taught in many ulama in Iraq. Amongst the ulama who learned from him in Iraq and one of his most prominent students in Iraq was Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. Ahmad bin Hanbal was his student and uh, that's why Imam Shafi first formulated his mazhab in Iraq. He first formulated the mazhab in Iraq. However, Afterwards, he moved to Egypt. When he moved to Egypt, he changed many of his rulings. Because in Egypt, the culture, the context, and the, the traditions were very different. The situation was very different from Iraq. 
So he changed many of his rulings. So that's why till today in the Shafi'i Mazhab, they say Al-Qawl Al-Qadim and Al-Qawl Al-Jadid. The old uh, Mazhab, the old opinion of Imam Shafi'i and the new opinion. So when they say sometimes, but Imam Shafi'i said like this, they say is that the old or the new? By old they mean what he said in Iraq, by the new they, what, they say what he said in Egypt. And usually what he said in Egypt is considered the final word, because that's later on. Mm. So in Egypt he became a very gigantic scholar and left, wrote all the great books that he wrote like a Risala and Kitabul Umm and so on. Uh, he even uh, disagreed with his Ustad Imam Malik on many issues, <clears throat> to the point of he even wrote a book in which he refuted some of the positions of Imam Malik. Right? Where he said, I disagree with this, 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 these things of Imam Malik. Yet, he did it, but not nowhere in the book did he mention Imam Malik's name. He didn't mention his name. He just said, some people say, some scholars say. And he gave his, uh, refuted it. So, uh, one of the people once told Imam Shafi'i that, uh, you have refuted Imam Malik, but he's your ustaz, among many other ustaz, you know. So, isn't that disrespectful to him? He said, no. Malik himself taught us to think independently. And he would not mind any uh, disagreement. And even though I disagree with my teacher on these particular issues, Wallahi, there is not a salah that I perform, except that after it I make dua for my parents or for Imam Malik. After every salah, after every namaz, I make dua for my parents and for Imam Malik, my ustad. But difference of opinion is normal among scholars and academics. And so uh, as long as it is done with adab and respect. So Imam Shafi'i was also a man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say in, uh, he used to make a one khatam of the Quran every single day. So he struggled to make one in Ramadan, 30 days. He used to make one every single day. And in Ramadan, he used to make two. He says, Ramadan, I can't just make one khatam, he used to make two. He was a man of great ibadah. Uh, he was known that people used to come to him with rich people with a lot of gifts and stuff, and he would give it all away to his students. The moment a man leaves, he gives all of it away to his students. He said, you need it more than me. So Imam Shafi'i is Imam Shafi'i. He was born in the year 150, and he passed away in the year two, uh, 204. And he was buried in Cairo. And inshallah, when you go to Cairo, you can visit his maqam. It's recently been renovated, so it is absolutely beautiful now. The masjid and maqam of Imam Shafi'i. And they've designed his maqam for many centuries in the shape of a boat or a ship. So if you look at his maqam, it looks like, like a ship. And they've designed it like that because he was known as the Baharul Ilm, the ocean of knowledge. Or the one who navigates the ocean of knowledge. So his maqam was designed like a ship. You know, in a certain uh, angle, if you look at it. So Imam Shafi'i was also a great lover of the Ahlul Bayt, as I mentioned. And one of the personalities that he had immense love for and respect for in Egypt itself was a lady from the Ahlul Bayt named Sayyida Nafisa. Sayyida Nafisa. Now, Sayyida Nafisa is the great granddaughter of Imam Al Hassan. Imam Al Hassan. So, her father is Al Hassan Al Anwar, whose father is Zayd Al Ablaj, whose father was Imam Al Hassan. So, in other words, uh, Sayyida Nafisa's dad is Imam Al Hassan's immediate grandson. Okay? So, Imam Al Hassan is Sayyida Nafisa's great grandfather. So, she's from the Ahlul Bayt. And she had migrated to Egypt and she was known to be an extremely pious woman. She would only be either seen in the masjid or in halaqa of knowledge and ibadah and worship. It is narrated that Sayyidah Nafisa radiallahu anha made more than 50 khatams of the Quran inside her own grave. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning she dug her own grave during her lifetime in her courtyard. She dug a grave and like a hole and she used to go sit inside there and make khatam of the Quran. 
So people would say, ah, Sayyida, Siti Nafisa, what are you doing? Why are you sitting inside that hole of mud and reading the Quran? She said, this is my qabr and I want to illuminate it with the book of Allah. So I'm preparing it right now. I'm warming it up right now. She made 50 khatam inside her own qabr. Subhanallah. You know, so imagine the, 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 the taqwa. And she used to be one of the people who were known as Sa'im al-Dahr. Which means those who fast continuously for the whole year. Except on the days of Eid. They fast every day of the year. The only day they don't fast is the day of Eid. Because it's haram by law to fast on the day of Eid. Other than that, every day of the year she used to be fasting. Her whole life. To the point that when she was to pass away, uh, uh, she became so sick once that she was so ill that the doctors told her that, Oh Sayyidah Nafisa, uh, you are very ill and you could die from this condition, so please break your fast. You need to break your fast, drink some water, eat something because this your condition is not good, you could die. So she smiled, she says, Doctor, for the last 50 years, I've been making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to die in a state of fasting. <laughs> He's saying I must break my fast, otherwise I'll die. He said, 50 years, last 50 years I'm making dua that, Ya Allah, I want to die while I'm fasting in a state of ibadah and fasting. <laughs> and he said, I must break my fast, otherwise I'm going to die. So yeah. this was, you know, the, those ladies of the Ahlul Bayt, the Sadat, that inherited that, that taqwa and that zuhud and ibadah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam and Ali radiallahu anhu. You know, there's always, in every generation of the Ahlul Bayt, you find these personalities. So she was like that, and she was a contemporary of Imam al-Shafi'i in Cairo. So it is narrated that whenever Imam al-Shafi'i would have any problem when he was in Cairo, he would go to Imam Sayyidina Nafisa or send a message to Sayyidina Nafisa asking her dua. Even if he couldn't find an answer to a certain mas'ala, you're right, it's a difficult question that came to him. What is the answer for this question? The people are waiting for the fatwa and he's not sure 100%. He would send one of the boys, he said, please send, take this message to Sayyidina Nafisa. And then in that message he would say, Sayyidina Nafisa, uh, I have this mas'ala, please make dua that Allah inspires me the answer to it, the correct answer to it. One day he told her when in her presence, he went to her personally, about the masala, she said, yeah, Shafa, you are way more learned than me. What must I tell you about masalas? You know, if, if, if you can't find the answer to it, how am I going to find the answer to it? I'm not a learned lady like you, a person like you. He said, no. Yeah, Sayyidina Nafisa, I didn't come to you to ask you for the answer to the, that masala, to that question. I've come to you to ask you for dua that Allah gives me the answer to that question. With your dua, Allah will inspire me the answer. So that was uh, the belief that Imam Shafi'i had in this waliya of Allah, the awliya. Today, nowadays, uh, people, uh, you know, try to mock on somebody who believes in the awliya and the pious people. But this Imam Shafi'i, he had this belief in Sayyidina Nafisa. So much so that when Imam Shafi'i was dying, he even wrote in his will, in his last words, he said to his people that when I die, when you take my janazah to the Grand Mosque, where you're going to have no janazah salah for me, First, take my body past the house of Sayyidina Nafisa. He said, what for what? He said, first you take my body there and you call her out to come and make dua and salah on the, my body first. She must come pray on my body first. And then you can take my body to the masjid for the janazah which is going to be like, you know, thousands of people and all that. And First, take my body to her house because her house was on the way. He said, first stop in front of her house and ask her to come out and pray for my forgiveness. <laughs> and then take my body to the masjid. Imagine a man like Imam Shafi'i has, who millions of people follow, millions of awliya follow Imam Shafi'i. They were Shafi'is. Imagine he had this type of belief in the maqam of Sayyidina, Sayyidina Nafisa radiallahu anha. He said, she must pray on my body. Maybe by her dua Allah will, you know, have rahmah on me. Alhamdulillah. So, this is the personality of Sayyidah Nafisa radiallahu anha wa radaha that the like of Imam al-Shafi'i makes tabarruk of her. And he is the Imam of Egypt. Sayyidah Nafisa radiallahu anha 
lived for many years in Egypt and when she passed away her husband who, who was Al Imam Ishaq bin Ja'far al Sadiq was the son of Imam Ja'far al Sadiq so she is the great granddaughter of Imam al Hassan and her husband was the great grandson of Imam Hussein okay she is the great granddaughter of Imam al Hassan and her husband was the great grandson of Imam Hussein Imam Ja'far al Sadiq to make it simple, is the son of Imam Muhammad al-Baqir. You remember Imam Muhammad al-Baqir? Mentioned him, I think, about 20 minutes ago. Yeah. yeah. Now his son is Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. Mm. Sayyidina Nafisa was married to Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq's son. Yes. So, uh, which is her, you know, other side of the family. So, when she passed away, he wanted to take her to bury her in Medina. Salamun take her, put her on a ship and from Egypt to Medina, not too far and she must be buried in Jannatul Baqi with Ahl al-Bayt but when that happened, the people of Egypt protested they said, no, we want the barakah of Sayyidina Nafisa in Egypt this holy woman, you know, if Imam Shafi'i was asking her dua you can imagine how many other people were asking her dua so uh, there, there was a whole fight that night so on the night of the Janazah, so in the dream that night, her husband saw the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ appeared to him and said to him, Oh Ishaq, leave Nafisa, my daughter, in Egypt, for the people of Egypt are blessed because of her. Hmm. The people of Egypt are blessed Shubhan because Allah. of her presence. So she's a leaver in Egypt. Hmm. She's a source of barakah for the people of Egypt. So she's buried in Egypt. They call her Karimat al Darain, Nafisa al Ilm. So her maqam is there in Cairo, a massive masjid and maqam and you can see a lot of women are there. It's, it's considered like the women's maqam as well. There's a lot of attachment they have to say the Nafisa radiallahu anhu. There's a saying, he did Siti Nafisa. Uh, Siti means our lady, Siti Nafisa. Now talking about the ladies of the Ahlul Bayt, then there is another great lady of the Ahlul Bayt that has a maqam in Cairo and that is none other than Sayyida Zainab. Or Siti Zainab. Sayyida Zainab radiallahu anha is the sister of Imam Hussein and the daughter of Sayyida Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. So Sayyida Zainab is high up there. She was born in the time of the Prophet وسلم, to his daughter Fatima. Father is Ali. And when she was born after Hassan and Hussein, she was there, the third one. She was born just after Sayyidah Fatima, her mother's other sister, older sister Zainab passed away. Who would be the daughter of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nabi Sallallahu daughter Zainab passed away and then her sister Fatima gave birth to a daughter. So when the daughter was born, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Fatima, we name her after your sister Zainab. She was named Zainab. And then after that, Sayyidah Fatima's other sister, Umm Kulsum, passed away. The youngest, one of the youngest daughters of the Nabi Sallallahu Just the one before Fatima. So then after that, Sayyidah Fatima had another daughter. So the Nabi Sallallahu said, and we name her after your sister, Umm Kulsum. Right? So that is a culture that even in our families we had for, uh, you know, till recent times, where a newborn child would be named after somebody from the family that passed away. If one of your elders, your father, your, somebody very close to you, a brother or a father or a mother, you would name, and then a child was just born after they died, you would name the child after that to keep their memory alive. And you would always tell the child, you never met your opa, but you named after your opa. You named Abu Bakr because your grandfather was Abu, you never met him. But you know, those were the type of family values we used to have. Now people want Bollywood names, you know, I want to name my son Shah Rukh Khan and to name my daughter Beyonce, is it halal or not halal? I said, even if it's halal, yeah, there's a million better names than that. You know. <laughs> so people's, you know, uh, priorities are messed up. And then they wonder why the children are coming out rotten, you know, uh, and completely off the track. Because the first thing is the name. It starts with the name. If you're giving the name with that baraka of that personality that you're giving, you know, then wallahi the barakah of that personality will rub off on them at some stage of their life at, at some stage I knew a man his name was Muhammad he became a murtad 
But many years after that, he accepted Islam again. He came back in the deen and they asked him, how did you come back in the deen? He said, you know what, I left the deen, I completely went off track, I left the deen, I don't want anything to do with Islam, I went very far away. He said, but people always call me Muhammad, you know. Whenever they see my name, Muhammad, oh, you're a Muslim, you know. So he said, everybody, keep, everybody keeps on reminding me that I'm a Muslim. So I go to, he lived in America, wherever, you know, he went in that, okay, so I, can I see some ID, sir? Okay, Muhammad, Muslim. Oh God, and he's, every time he has to explain to people that he's not a Muslim anymore, but everybody who meets him calls him a Muslim. Muslim people say, Muhammad, salam alaikum. So he says, I could leave Islam, but Islam couldn't leave me. Until he said, I said, you know what, let me study Islam again, you know, and he started kind of like now reading up again, and he heard that lecture, and then it sparked something in him, and then he read that book, and finally he found his way back to Islam, after like a 20 or 30 year break, if you want to call it that. But he said, I came back because my name was Muhammad. So, you know, when those parents looked at that baby when he was born and said, we named him Muhammad after Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi At some stage, the barakah of that name pulled him back to the straight path. But now you're going to start off by naming your child something weird, you know. You know, the name that's not even Muslim or not Muslim, you know. Then what do you expect? So, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Uh, I mean, I've heard people tell me, I want to give my child a name, but I don't want it to sound too Muslim. Subhanallah, you know, why? You know, I want my child to, to, be, to be known as a Muslim. I want the world to know he's a Muslim, you know. So, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Um, so, you know, that's the barakah of the names and so on. So, uh, she was named uh, Umm Kulsum after her auntie. So, Sayyida Zainab was born in the time of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she grew up in the lap of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she lived very long, radiallahu anha. Imagine if your mother is Fatima. What kind of training and iman and akhlaq you have? And your father, Ali. Okay, your opa, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Okay, your, your buta, Hassan and Hussain. You know, where, whichever way you turn, you're only seeing iman, islam, akhlaq. There's no, that's what you're surrounded with, you know. So that's the household she grew up in, in Medina. But she lived long enough to witness the day of Karbala when her brother was martyred for the sake of the haq, for the defending the haq and standing up to Yazid, the tyrant. And she's the one who Imam al Hussein, before he left the camp, he told her that, Oh Zainab, I may not come back after today. And I'm going there, I'm probably not going to come back. You know, there's 73 of us against 4,000 soldiers of Yazid. So, if anything happens to me, please look after the children, the women, because Imam Hussein's wife was there, Imam Hussein's uh, two daughters were there, Imam Hussein's other, uh, you know, the, the family members and other, so there was a lot of ladies there and so on. He said, look after all of them, you're the head of the family now after me. And I warn you, do not beat your chest or tear your clothes or pull your hair if anything happens to me. Because those are some of the things that people, the Arab women used to do before Islam, you know. Uh, know that whatever will happen is the will of Allah. And that's what Sayyidah Zainab encompassed. So after the battle was over and everyone was martyred, Imam Hussein was martyred, they cut, he severed his head off from his body and they paraded the head as the practice of the people of Jahiliyyah. And this is something the Prophet ﷺ specifically forbade the Sahaba from doing. Because in, after the battle of Badr, one of the Sahaba chopped off Abu Jahl's head and brought it to the Prophet ﷺ. He was dead already, but he chopped his head off and he brought it to the Nabi Sallallahu and threw it by his, by his feet. He said, Ya Rasulullah, there's the head of this scoundrel. The one who tortured you and abused you and insulted you and murdered your sahabas and did these horrible things for years. You know, took the spear and put it between the legs of Sumayya until it came out from the other side and she died in front of her husband and her son. This evil, horrible man. There's his head by your feet. Allah has shown us the day that Allah promised us has come. Every dog shall have his day. That's his day. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Alhamdulillah, all praise be to Allah for fulfilling his promise to us. Because when that used to happen, Allah had promised the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will have your day. O Muslimin, you will have your day against this man and his people. But sabr, for now sabr. And they suffered for 13 years. 
you will have your day. So when the day of Badr happened, they knew that's the day. يَوْمَ نَبْتَشُ الْبَتْشَةَ الْكُبْرَىٰ إِنَّا مُنْتَقِمُونَ So the Nabi said, Alhamdulillah, all praise be to Allah for fulfilling His promise to us. And then he looked at them and said, and never do this again with anyone's head. And never do this again with anyone's head. I forbid you from severing and mutilating the bodies of the dead. He said, Alhamdulillah for fulfilling his promise to us, there's Abu Jahl's head lying in front of us, but I forbid you from mutilating anybody's body. Don't do this again. I don't want to see this again. The bodies of the enemies of Islam. Yet in Karbala, people who called themselves Muslims severed the head of his son, Imam al Hussein. I mean, they weren't happy just to kill him. They cut his head off and they paraded it to show that this is the trophy. You know, this is what we the Jahiliya way, these were very common in many cultures to do this, but against Islam. So even the children and the family of Imam Hussein, when they saw the body, they started crying and screaming. The women, when the, the, the daughters, they even asked her, why is my father's, my daddy's head on the spear? And she said, just, you know, she had to calm them all down and control them. And after that, all the ladies of the Ahl al-Bayt were taken in, the men were all martyred. The ladies were all taken with the head of Imam Hussein on his spear, surrounded by the army of Yazid all the way to Damascus. They were taken all the way to the court of Yazid bin Muawiyah, and the head was on top. And so, as, as they were carrying the head, uh, the sister Sayyidah Zainab used to console the, late, the children and say, Don't worry, your daddy is still here. Your daddy is still protecting you. Because you see his head. They say in the night time, they would hear the head reciting Quran. People would wake up and say, Well, who's reciting Quran? Who's Bacha in this time of the night? And they see, it's the head of Imam al Hussein. And one of the poets wrote at that time that salutes to you, O Hussein, you rise above them in life and in death. You rise above them in life and in death. Because even in death, you are above all of them. Because the head is on the spear, all of them are below it. So you are above all of them. So the head was taken to Yazid's court and it was kept in front of him. And Yazid started poking the head with his with a stick. You know, just to play with it. So as he was doing that, one of the old Sahaba of the Prophet had also come because the announcement was that Hussein's had been, head has been brought to Damascus. Everybody come and witness the head of the rebel. You know, in the old days when the rebel was uh, beheaded, they used to bring the head and everybody used to celebrate. The enemy of the state has been killed. So people came, so one of the old Sahaba was like 90 years old was there and he saw Yazid picking on the head. So he said to Yazid, stop. But oh, wallahi, I have seen with these two eyes of mine Rasulullah kissing those cheeks. He said, the cheeks that you are busy poking, I have seen with my eyes the Prophet kiss those cheeks. Stop poking them. So he became embarrassed and he stopped poking it. And then he looked at Sayyidah Zainab and said, Well, today is the day of victory. My family has been victorious over your family. Your father fought my father and your brother fought me. But God has granted us victorious, and your men are all dead, and we are alive. Hmm. So Sayyidah Zainab said, O oh Yazid, Wallahi ma ra'ayna illa jamila. He says, We have not seen anything but goodness and beauty. And those were men whose time had come to return to Allah, and they returned on their times. But they lived for haq and they died for haq. But you should fear about your akhirah. You should fear for what you are living for and what you're going to die for. Their time had come and they left on their times. So she gave very strong answers to Yazid on that day, which rattled him and embarrassed him in front of his court. And that's why she's called the spokeswoman of the Ahl al-Bayt, Aqil at Bani Hashim. Uh, in the end, Yazid was embarrassed and ordered that they should be kept in part of the palace. And then he ordered that they should be sent away back to Medina. The head of Imam al Hussein was kept there in a room in the mosque of Damascus. And after a while, it was paraded again in the cities of Syria to say that the rebel has been executed, Roman style. And it was then left in the city of Ascalan. Ascalan is now today called Ashkelon, it's in Palestine. The Jews call it Ashkelon. It was kept in a maqam there and it was buried by a Christian man. A Christian priest. The Christian priest asked the Muslim people, whose head is hanging there on that pole there? 
They said, that's Hussain bin Ali. They said, who? Who is he? He said, he's a grandson of our Prophet. He rebelled against our ruler. and He said to them, uh, you know, I'm ashamed of you people. For by God, if we Christians had even found the donkey of Jesus, we would have worshipped it. We had to find the donkey of Jesus, we would have worshipped it. Is this how you treat the grandson of your Prophet? No man. So he took the head out and he buried it. The Christian priest. He said, Muslims are scared. Because they don't want to look like sympathizing. So he buried it. He said on that night, he saw a man of great noor and illumination in his dream. Illuminated personality, he said. But he said, greetings, who are you? He said, I am Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, Rasulullah. So the Christian man said, greetings to you, O Muhammad. He knew about it. He lived in a Muslim rule, so he knows Muhammad. He said, greetings to you, O Muhammad. What can I do for you? What do I owe this visit to? So the Prophet said, I have come to thank you for burying my son. I have come to thank you for burying my son. They have been parading his head for one whole month after they killed him. For one whole month his head is being, not being given a ghusl and a burial. Thank you for, you know you don't deny a janaza in Islam. Yeah, so he said, no, I did what I had to do. So he said, and I want to reward you with Jannatul Firdaus on condition that you recite the Kalima. And if you recite the Kalima, I guarantee you entry into Jannah without a question or without an answer. Straight, straight entry into Jannah. So SubhanAllah, the man woke up in a dream. It was so real that the next morning he went to the masjid and he said to the, the Imam, please take my Shahada and make me a Muslim. And the Imam was shocked. I knew the priest from that church down the road there. He said, yes. He said, what happened? And he told them the story. After Salatul Fajr, he told everybody the story that happened. And said, everybody in the masjid cried. Not out of joy, but more out of shame. That they couldn't honor the Prophet ﷺ's son. And it had to be a Christian man that had to take him off and bury him. And we were all just scared and did nothing. So his head was there for many, many centuries in Ashkelon, in the Maqam, until the Crusades happened. During the Crusades, the Christians that came, Christian armies united from all the countries of Europe, from Germany, from France, from Spain, from England, from Scotland, from Hungary, from Italy, they came. The counts and the dukes and the warriors and the knights, Templar you know, of Europe, to so-called liberate the Holy Land from the Muslims. Because that's the land of Christ, the land of Jesus. Palestine is where Jesus lived and died and what, according to them. So they came, but more in reality, there's more economic reasons. They came to rob and rape, you know, because Europe had just went into great, great recession at that time. So uh, they came, they were, and they were barbarians. Whenever they enter any town, they kill everybody there, they rape the women, they burn down every mosque and maqam, turn it into a church or they destroy it. Barbaric. So they were coming near the city of Ashkelon, Asqalan, very near the forefather now Ibn Hajar al Asqalaniya from there. So the, the people of Asqalan then wrote a letter to the e king of Egypt, the Sultan of Egypt, who was the great lover of the al Bayt, and said, O oh, Sultan, the Christians are coming and they are going to demolish the maqam from Imam Hussain, they're going to do terrible things. We want to evacuate the city. Uh, please, we want to take and send the head of Imam Hussain to you send a group of warriors to, to take it to safety. So he sent his army to uh, Ashkalan and they opened up the maqam and they took out the head. When they took it out, they said it was 500 years later. It was still fresh and fragrant. They said we smelled a fragrance like we have never smelt in our lives. No perfume atar can match that. And the head was still, they said if you press the cheek you see, you see redness. And they took the head all the way to Egypt. Now interestingly, the maqam in Ashkelon is still there till today. It's a city in Israel now, in Ashkelon they call it. That maqam where his head used to be is still there. Because it so happened that the crusaders couldn't enter the city and there was a fight and they diverted and so they never came to that city. So the maqam was remained there empty. So uh, they took it, when they took it to Egypt, at that time the Sultan of Egypt had prepared a massive masjid and a maqam for Imam Hussein. And when it came into Egypt, the Sultan and his entire army welcomed it. And they welcomed it bareheaded and bare feet. So in Arab culture, to show respect, you take off your shoes. 
in, in the presence of any holy place so, and to show respect to a personality you take off your headgear you take off your turban the English people used to take off their hats so the king and the soldiers all of them welcomed the head of Imam Hussein in Cairo no shoes on and no turbans on they took off all of them bareheaded and not riding on horses or anything Rajilin on their, on their feet on their legs until the head was taken and buried in the maqam that is there and known today in Cairo as the maqam in the masjid of Sayyidina al Hussein, and it is the most magnificent and most well known and famous mosque of Cairo every single person in Cairo knows the masjid of Sayyidina al Hussein. in fact that entire region of Cairo is called Sayyidina al Hussein. and even if you want to go there for a pharmacy you say where do you want to go to Sayyidina al Hussein? You know, everybody knows it's, it's the most important mosque in Cairo. So uh, that's the maqam of Sayyidina Al-Hussein is there. So you can go to that masjid and you can still feel the power and the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam there uh, uh, in, you know, the maqam of Imam Al-Hussein. Uh, it's a place where du'as are accepted, uh, du'as are answered. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, you know, has really blessed that place. It's, a, it's, it's like a piece of Medina there. So that is the maqam of Sayyidina Hussain. Now coming back to Sayyida Zainab, Sayyida Zainab went back to Medina, but in Medina she narrated the story of Karbala to everyone. She is the only witness now. All the men are dead. So she told everybody and because of her telling the people of Medina what happened in Karbala, it incited the people and in the end the people of Medina revolted against Yazid. So when that news spread that she is telling everybody what happened, the orders came to, from Yazid that she needs to leave Medina. I don't want Zainab in Medina. So the narration says that she was recalled to Damascus again. And he kept her in a house in Damascus. Under house arrest. And then some narrations say that then she said that I would like to move from Damascus. I don't want to be here. They said you can't go back to Medina. And you can't go to Iraq. Where there's a lot of supporters of the Halal Bayt. She said no I want to go to Egypt. So they, said, they said, okay, go to Egypt then. So she moved to Egypt and she lived there and she passed away there. So that is the maqam of Sayyidah Zainab. But she also had a maqam in Damascus. So there's a difference of opinion. Is she in Damascus? Is she in the, if you meet the Egyptians, they're going to say, Sittina Zainab andana. Wa Rabbil Arsh Allah. You know, and the Akhuha Sayyidina al Hussein. You meet the Syrians and they're going to say, La, Sayyidah Zainab Hoon. You know. You know, so everybody wants to claim it for themselves, you know, so it's about, you know, so you're going to ask anybody in Syria, they're going to say, no, Sayyidah Zainab is here in Damascus, this is the maqam. As the Egyptian, they're going to say, Sayyidah Zainab is by us. So they say that the house where she lived, that is the, where the maqam is today in Damascus. So there is a difference of opinion, but either way, the, the two maqams, you can feel the presence and the spirituality of Sayyidah Zainab in both these maqams. At the end of the day, the pious people, wherever you mention them, even here now, you can feel the power and the jazbah. So, uh, even if that was the house or the grave, if they even spend a day in a particular place, in a room, that room will be blessed till Qiyamah. These are the personalities of the Ahlul Bayt. So, inshallah, in Cairo, the, the great maqams are of Sayyidina Sayyid al Hussein, and then uh, Sayyidina Zainab, his sister, then Sayyidina Nafisa, and then Imam Shafi. Of course, there are many other maqams as well, many awliya Allah, but we're not going into all those details in Alexandria and Imam Busairi, the author of the Burda. Yeah, and then uh, in, uh, next to him is his Sheikh Imam Al Mursi Al Abul Abbas. In Cairo, the Sidi ibn Atayillah, the author of the Hikam, his maqam is there. And in many other awliya Allah, you're going to find in Cairo, even from the Ahlul Bayt. And also in Cairo is the maqams of the Firauns, <laughs> uh, which are called the pyramids. And the pyramids are from the wonders of the world and it is absolutely baffling to our minds how they were built thousands of years ago. Today even they can't build anything like it with that size of stones. And that's why our shuyuk used to say that the pyramids were built with the help of the jinn. Because those people, those pharaohs and stuff had immense control over magic and jinns and sorcery. And we know the story of Musa alayhi salam and the sorcerers. To be kulli sahirin alim. These people were heavily involved in sorcery and all that. A lot of that died out when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrived in the scene. You know, the, the, the jinns and all that power were cut down to half. 
So these people had these powers, so they built it, for it's a wonder of the world and it's a great thing to see and see how people, Allah granted these people these great powers, but when they made kufr and denied Allah, Allah destroyed them. Today there's no sign of them, it's finished and clapped. You know, they are, so their bodies are there in mummies and you can go look at those pyramids and uh, you know in Giza and Egypt has a very great history so you're going to find all of that interestingly the Azhar is also there is named after say the Fatima al Zahra and uh, it is one of the oldest you know uh, universities in the world and one of the most highly respected if not the most highly respected Islamic university in the entire world there are thousands and thousands of students from every nation on earth studying in the Azhar so inshallah hopefully when you're there you can meet some of the South Africans studying there uh, and it represents a very balanced and moderate understanding of Islam you know you can always trust an Azhari scholar you know you, you, you can be good with them uh, and because they, they teach all four mazhabs in the Azhar even though majority of them are Shafi'i because Imam Shafi'i is there but they teach the Hanafi, the Shafi'i, the Malik they even teach the mazhab of Imam al awzai the Ja'fari, the Zaydi the because they want an Azhari scholar to have knowledge of all the schools of thought. Even if he follows one, then he must know the others. Because wow. you never know when you have a need to take something from another mazhab in a particular situation. So that is also in a nutshell some of the things about Egypt. And as I said, Egypt also has a large Christian population. So you will see that as well. So inshallah, we will conclude with that. And uh, we wish you all a blessed trip. Ameen. And uh, you enjoy all these historical sites and uh, you know benefit from them and in the holy places keep us in your du'as as well and make du'a for us and our ummah and our nation inshallah when you are there in these places. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah khadirat al-shaykh wa khudin waisi for that uh, insightful and informative session. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept inshallah. Amen. And uh, if we had more time we would speak about the traffic in Cairo mm. and some of the good food that's there as well in many of the places we are going to go to. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put khair, barakah, safety and tawfiq in these trips inshallah amin, to amin. make us closer to Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam inshallah next week we'll be having our final class we will be discussing our internal arrangements our methodology of travel we'll discuss a bit of companionship and suhbah of travel and we are hoping that by Friday or so inshallah we will receive our tickets mm-hmm. and all the necessary components for our travel so we'll make contact and we can either pick it up over the weekend or on Monday next week, inshallah. For those who are traveling, you want to do Forex, uh, Iqbal said you can just contact him directly and he will send you your e-tickets and what's required so that you can get your Forex and any questions that you have. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the visiting of the great ones, may he make us also their characteristics around Ameen. on us. Ameen. And may he grant us beautiful, wonderful spiritual memories. Ameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Make it a means of us getting closer to him, inshallah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim al Asr, in the Insan that we hosr, in the Zina Amen who Amen is Salihad, the Wasm and Hak, or the Wasm. Jazakullah, Hell and Jazak, was Salam Alaikum, Warahmatullahi Ta'ala, Wabah.